Hey everybody, how's it going? Oh, um, no, this is not Louis Rossman's channel, so we ain't gonna start off with that here. Um, anyway, um, today we're gonna do something a little different. I'm gonna talk about a blog post that I've been seeing circulating on social media by Sean Kutzko, KX9X. So, you may know Sean from where his past employer was, the ARL where he was a contest branch manager for many years and he was the person who was in charge of national parks on the air which was a really good flagship radio event that i wish DWRL would do again in some form but um maybe it'll happen who knows all right he talks about five ways ham radio has changed in the last 40 years so he says he's been licensed for almost 40 years. And he says hobby radio, not ham radio, hobby radio has been part of his life in one form or another since he was three years old. In that time, it has morphed and changed in some very interesting ways. And he couldn't predict those ways. And not all changes progress. He's definitely seen some stuff that he didn't find particularly positive about the way ham radio has evolved. Here are five major ways I feel ham radio has changed since I earned my novice license back of May of 1982. And of course he says his opinions are his own and he speaks for nobody but himself. You go, Sean. Yeah, and I say the same thing because I really do speak only for myself. Shortwave listening isn't as much fun anymore. While not strictly ham radio, many hams my age got started in the hobby through shortwave wrist radio listening or SWLing. I started off with a Radio Shack Globe Patrol shortwave kit, which his brother built and gave to him, okay? And then he wrapped about a mile of copper wire around his bedroom for an antenna, and he rarely took his headphones off after that. And he talked about all the stations he received from... The BBC, Radio Moscow, Radio Beijing, Radio Australia, HCJB, and so many others. He had a solid grasp on world geography and so on. And of course, now these days, all the big shortwave stations are gone thanks to the internet. It's more economically feasible to stream your programming online than to main, maintain several 500 kilowatt broadcast facilities around the world. There's a little more to it than that, though. Uh, there's still stuff on shortwave, most of it's religious broadcasts in China, Radio International, and he still tunes to see what's on the air, but the radio spectrum is definitely shifted, and streaming the BBC online just doesn't scratch the radio itch like it did. Talks about AM band DX, and he shows off some QSL cards. Well, that is for very large part, I would say, almost entirely true. The only part I would disagree with is that you know you, the the internet streaming has replaced shortwave so kind of you have to understand what shortwave broadcasting is really about though shortwave broadcasting was used by world governments basically as a propaganda tool and i mean propaganda tool in that each of these national shortwave broadcasters would disseminate signals to show the world that hey we are a great country that we um, are better than a lot of countries and we are good and to, to increase the international image. Because obviously governments would not be spending billions of dollars just to provide information to other countries. No, they, they do it for national image and also for, um, I wouldn't say, um, information you know uh, and such uh, disinformation rather i would say more of the line of you know some of it was outright propaganda there were some stations of course some run by the voa that were definitely not hidden as propaganda operations you had like radio marti and you know they were um others so they were kind of um there to to actually um you know, uh, they were there to, to definitely propagandize. Today, in the world of social media, a lot of that has shifted. You'll find that a lot of 
prop- propaganda is no longer shortwave broadcasts that people listen to. You'll find that a lot of a lot of it now is in social media where you have operatives posting stuff on social media and foreign state actors on social media pushing their propaganda that way. And um, it is there. It's definitely there. I mean, you know, there's absolutely no denying that it's there. So I think that now provides a lot of the propaganda that shortwave radio used to do. Remember what brought out all, all of this? Back in those days, we didn't have any way to achieve cheap long-distance communication. A cheap meaning cheap for the listener. We didn't have the internet, obviously. Phone calls cost about a few dollars a minute if you were making long-distance international phone calls. And um, it generally was one of my friends, um, Joel Wagner and 2IAG, told me, he said that back in the day, ham radio was a great free way to communicate. So anyway, long story short, short wave listening is more or less dead. You have the few of them. Um, Alan Weiner, of course, has his free speech radio station where you have all sorts of free speech. And I mean, I really do mean all sorts of free speech. You have people who say things that are not nice. And then you have people who say things that are very informative. So, you know, free speech is free speech, right? You have a lot of religious broadcasters, mostly either evangelical Christians, or you have a few who are just way out there who are broadcasting things like the Bible says the earth is flat. Um, Alan Wiener got a 500 kilowatt... um, transmitter and antenna out of that deal but I'm sure he doesn't believe the earth is flat because he needs to beam his signal across the globe (laughs) okay shortwave listening so you know I told Sean on Twitter that shortwave listening you know he talked about things in this blog post that are, are pathways to the hobby no longer is shortwave listening going to be a pathway to the hobby. And that's kind of tragic because you'll find that shortwave listeners already knew how to set up antennas. They already knew about receivers. They already knew about propagation. They already, um, and some of them were actually, you know, they were introduced slowly into ham radio by the shortwave listening magazines. Like when in the 90s, When, before I got licensed, we used to buy Popular Communications magazine. And by the way, that that has been shut down. It was owned by CQ Communications. And they shut that down because I think the readership just dwindled to where it became unprofitable. They had a lot of, of different forms of hobby radio communications. They had shortwave. They had CB radio. They had ham radio, they had scanning, and you'll find that a lot of of those have just diminished. Even scanning is more or less not as good as it used to be because a lot of scanning now is digital, and a lot of the um, a lot of the public safety infrastructure that used to be freely available to listen to on scanners is now digital one uh, so you need a more expensive scanner to listen to it and two it some of them might be encrypted of course you know if it's if it's encrypted you're not going to listen be able to listen to it and why do you not or not you think it's wrong or right for it to be encrypted i think that you know routine communications of public safety should not be encrypted because the public has an interest to know of course, if you're talking about something like a, a drug um, drug operation or national security, of course that should be encrypted. But routine things like traffic stops and and you know regular dispatch, police dispatch and stuff, no, that should not be encrypted. And um, by the way, journalists used to listen to the scanners a lot. I don't know if they still do, and that's how they used to get a, a heads up on all the local news. So a lot of these these auxiliary 
quote unquote radio hobbies, more or less gateway drugs into ham radio have gone by the wayside. And I'm not sure how we're going to substitute for that. I think we do have to definitely find new avenues. Thankfully, not all the avenues have been cut off. A lot of computer hobbyists back in the day got involved in ham radio and vice versa. So today you have people who are computer hobbyists as distinguished from computer users. Okay, they're computer users and they're computer hobbyists. They're people who use computers just to check email and watch YouTube videos. By the way, like and subscribe if you haven't already. Um, and there are people who use computers for hobby purposes. You know, they write software in their free time. They learn computer architecture in their free time for fun. They, they just, you know, they're into computers for fun. They love fixing old computers. They, you know, I mean, today is less pronounced as computers have become more of an appliance than anything. Back when I was into computers, computers were more or less a novelty and a fun thing to learn. But eventually, um, and we had like computer clubs and such like that. Today, computers are just so ubiquitous, you just don't have that anymore. And I fear a lot of the same is happening to radio hobbies, by the way. Free communications, long distance communications become so ubiquitous that people just don't find ham radio to be that special anymore. So we have to reinvent ourselves. So, um, yeah, that's shortwave listening. I did have a lot of fond memories of shortwave. And I hope I can relive that. Next one's uh, no CW requirement. And he talks about how uh, he passed his five words a minute Morris exam. And he had to wait for his license in the mail three months later. Wow, that's lightning fast. I had to wait for my license six months from England, uh, the license exam. And it was a necessary evil, and he was confined to the 40 meter novice band, and etc. etc. And CW is Morse code is is gone as a licensing requirement, but it's still very popular to learn. And that's true. We have a lot of great clubs around here. We have um, that teach, you know, in the amateur radio space that teach Morse code. Long Island CW Club is great. These guys do a great job. They teach CW, and I always love to talk them up every time they um, I get the chance. So, LICW. You have CW Ops, another great club that teaches Morse code. And you have the Straight Key Century Club, our number 2725, where they teach you how to, to learn Morse code on a straight key. And they have special events, so... Hams love Morse code. I don't think Morse code in ham radio is ever going to go away. Ever. It's just something we do. And it's a it's a dirt simple way to communicate. It's not, you know, you don't need a computer. You don't need any, you don't need a microphone. You know, you just need to have two pieces of wire to touch together. And you have Morse code. I think the CW requirement going away. While it did cause a lot of heartburn, it was probably the right thing to do at that time. And, you know, it was just time to, to, to let it go. I mean, you know, there was some argument of keeping it for the, the highest license class, but I think eventually it just had to go. And um, people made arguments about how it was a filter, you know, a lid filter, meaning that it would keep on bad operators. People thought that it, you know, it was a tradition. Yeah, okay. And everybody must know CW. Mm. Well, it's, you know, it, it should not be taken as... There are some people who still want to live that tradition, and that's fine. I do think that clubs and the AWRL also offering Morse code proficiency certificates is a good idea to keep people who want to to show off their achievement of a knowledge of Morse code. But I don't think it should be a requirement for a license. Um, and now you can get a call sign within hours of passing your, your exam, by the way. It's not three months. I waited six months. And um, 
Yeah, so, you know, that's 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 pretty obvious. Next, we talk about digital. Okay. Well, I might do another uh, complete vi uh, video about digital and its effect on amateur radio. But he, when he's talking about digital, he's talking mainly about FT8. He did mention about RTTY. He talked about um, computers and, you know. And by the way, Joe Taylor's a friend of mine. Um, I like Joe. He's, you know, what he's done for ham radio has been very good. I think that all things aside, giving radio amateurs the ability to use low power and limited antennas was always a plus. I think the dark side was that some people took it too far and they went full auto and they have their computers making contacts for months on end. And uh, I think that's sad. I mean, you know, there is a time and place for that. There is whisper for propagation checking and automatic contacts, but I don't think that FTH should be fully automated because, I mean, frankly, where's the operator skill in that? Um, moon bounce, I know there's a lot of heartburn in the moon bounce community. <laughs> and, um, you know, because some people, they prided themselves in these huge antennas like W5UN and his big, his big antenna array on wheels that would basically rotate around a pole on a set of wheels only in Texas, Texas-sized. He talks particularly about six meters. And, you know, my, my roving partner on these amateur radio VHF contests, Andrea K2EZ, she was pretty, you know, she was pretty much of the opinion that six meters has completely changed because of FT8. And I remember at Six Meter Barbecue, when that event was taken over by Flex Radio and DX Engineering, um, we had a discussion among a, a lot of our Six Meter DXers and um, operators and enthusiasts, VHF enthusiasts, that, yeah, you know, Six Meters is not the same anymore. Nobody gets on a single sideband voice or CW Morse code anymore. And that's true. And, um, you know, it, it, pe people, but people make some pretty, I, I think, you know, frivolous arguments about this where they say, oh, you know, it's not real radio if you can't hear it. Well, no. I think that, you know, it is real radio if you can receive and decode a signal. But, I do think that it's wonderful that we could push the envelope that way. I just think that the loss of single sideband CW during the, the stronger openings is, is 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 huge. So I don't know what the solution for that is. I do think that in the contest, maybe weighting the Morse code and voice contacts more than digital will probably encourage people to get on those more. So, you know, we're, we're, um, we're there. And by the way, all of this has been enabled because, again, like I said, computers have become ubiquitous. Computers have become where they're, the processing power is just amazing now. I mean, you have more computing power in the palm of your, on your wrist than you do than was in the space shuttle or you know, the Apollo lander. So... There's, you know, and these sound card digital modes use cheap sound cards as, as modems. Well, as, as um, analog to digital converters, and the modem is actually in the software. So, yeah. Uh, the next one is the role of ham radio in emergency communications. So ham radio and MCOM, you know, I've always had a love hate relationship with ham radio MCOM. I do think MCOM is necessary. It's absolutely necessary for us to to help our community, give back, and quite frankly, I think that ham radio will not be around if we couldn't help out in times of need. But that, that role is diminishing fast because you have the wireless carriers building very robust infrastructure you have the public safety infrastructure being more robust. You do have a lot of 
served agencies getting their own radios that use satellites. And the big elephant's room is going to be Elon Musk's Starlink, of you know SpaceX's Starlink, which is basically going to give you internet access anywhere, period. And you don't have to, you know, it'll be fast and it will be cheap. There are people testing it. They're getting 100 megs download and it, it's just, um, you know, it's just amazing out in the middle of nowhere. So in a disaster zone, you just bring some Starlink dishes, you point those up at the sky and you're good to go. But in some countries, we're reminded that there is still a need for ham radio. Like you find like in Central America where these storms are hitting, they will be pretty much down and out. And it will be ham radio that will come in and help them recover. I think a lot of us take for granted what we have here in the United States where we have the money and the the infrastructure to, you know, to, to have disaster relief available. A lot of these countries, they don't have that because they're just so poor. They don't have a lot of money for infrastructure. So ham radio is their backup. And I think uh, like shortwave listening, a lot of the a lot of these poorer countries will will not depend on the internet for their um, for, for whatever purpose that the radio served. However, there are still some places where ham radio could play a role. There are cutting edge networks such as Arden, the Amateur Radio Emergency Digital Network, where they actually use mesh networking, they use enhanced um, mesh networking gear. Out west, there have been hams using this gear to put out, to monitor wildfires, and that's that's been pretty good. So I think MCOM will go in that direction. Then he talks about it being more popular than ever. Being more popular than ever. I have a theory about that. He said there are almost 750,000 licensees in the U.S. and a lot of them are fascinated with new technology and experimentation. The entire point of ham radio, and I agree with that, space communication, software-defined radio, building and hacking devices, learn electronics, propagation, etc., etc., etc. And he could not be happier about the state of ham radio today, and it'll continue to change and evolve, and such. And Sean, I agree. I do think that ham radio will continue to get better. I do think it'll have its challenges. And I always tell people, I told, I might have mentioned this in my QSO Today uh, interview. If you are a ham and you get disinterested in the hobby, don't let your license lapse, okay? You can put it aside, take care of yourself. I've had instances in my life where ham radio kind of took a back seat because of life challenges or other interests. But I didn't let my license lapse, okay? I kept my license and when I was ready to get back fully into ham radio, I did. And I didn't have to go and take a test again. I had my old call sign. I was ready to go. So... This is the advice I give to people. I say if you're if you become interested in ham radio but you figure, oh, you know, I want to take a break. Maybe it's not for me yet. Um, okay, keep your call sign. You know, it's free and we hope it remains free, by the way. And just keep on, you know, keep 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 your call sign there. One day you you might find yourself reinterested interested again. The large number of licensees. I think a lot of the new licensees now are coming into it because they realize that they need some backup form of communications. I've been doing a couple of licensing classes. I've been teaching them. And some of these people flat out mentioned to me, they said, yes, I want a means to communicate when we have chaos because they think that the country is heading, the United States, by the way, is heading into a state of chaos given the contentiousness of political events, um, including riots by certain groups. You have also this whole coronavirus thing, 
which we don't know when it's going to end, if ever, and how many people are going to be affected by it. You have the elections for president, how contentious that's been. And you have, quite frankly, the threat of something bad happening. You see the same in other things like where people see things bad are going to happen. They go and they buy firearms. You know, they buy firearms because they feel that that will keep them protected. But here's my warning about this. If you go and buy radios or you buy firearms, don't just buy it and stash it away and wait for the day comes when you're going to need it. What you should do is you should learn to use your tools like you learn to use your radios, get some training, meet up with local people who are familiar with it or look on YouTube or look on other resources that will help you learn more about your equipment, right? Don't just buy a 20 pack of Balfangs and stick them in the bunker and figure that when doomsday comes that you're going to to just have those available for you to use. No, you have to stay in practice. You have to learn how to use your radios. And realistically, if you're buying the Baofengs, understand that the Baofengs not going to get you 50 miles of range, no matter what your your friends tell you. Uh, you know, you have to learn the limitations and capabilities of your radio. Of course, like I said, there are people who take a licensing class and they learn about it and they become genuinely interested and maybe they they become interested in ham radio as a hobby or maybe they stick with the prepper mindset you know what either one's fine for me because i think that eventually the preppers might become interested in ham radio as um for its its basis and purpose which is one to provide emergency communications as a public service to to have a um, a pool of electronics experts and tech technicians, also to enhance the radio art in operational and technical phases of the hobby, and finally foster international goodwill. So I do I do think that people who are getting into it as an SHTF type of communications will eventually, some of them at least, will probably settle into amateur radio as a hobby. I'm, I'm cool with that. I would like to see more revival of school and college amateur radio clubs. I like to see where you have professors who are licensed and teaching their students. I had a couple of them. And of course, my friend Ted Rappaport, M9NB. He's, uh, well, he's, I think he's retired now. Uh, a professor at NYU School of Engineering where he ran the, the Wireless Institute and a very brilliant guy uh, but you know like a lot of hams with brilliance comes a little bit you know of being interesting so to speak so I definitely think we need more of those and we need more ordinary people being hams so um, could I be happy about the state of ham radio? I think it's a mixed bag. I'm very happy with a lot of things that are in ham radio. I do enjoy the kind of collaboration we have now. In this time of coronavirus, I'm reaching out to new hams on YouTube. I'm reaching out to new hams. I'm reaching out to existing hams on YouTube. I'm reaching out to people on virtual club meetings via Zoom or other video conferencing platforms. So... I'm really glad that we have this technology available to us. But sometimes I just miss the magic of radio. And I think the magic of radio that has been long gone is probably going to affect us in some negative way. At the same time, I hope we can make up for it. All right, I've said enough. Thank you for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. Keep us making more videos. This weekend, I'm going to do a one more on the connectors and then I'm going to give that topic a break and then we're going to go for other stuff. I'm going to give you a couple of things I want to cover in future videos. One, I have a group of friends, particularly one friend in India, um, Barthi, uh, VU2, RBI. She runs a net of YLs on 
in the um, at six o'clock Indian Standard Time, which is in the morning, uh, U.S. Eastern Time, and we have a variety of check-ins. So it's very nice to to have that net. I want to do a video on that net, and also her act activities in the National Institute of Amateur Radio in India. And my friends in Trinidad have asked me Trinidad and Tobago, because that's the name of the country. It's two islands, Trinidad and Tobago have asked me if I could talk about radio in Trinidad and Tobago. They want to send me some pictures. I sure I said, sure, send me some pictures, send me some video. You know, if it wasn't for this virus, I would, I would probably want to go there and do a video. But for now, I think I'll have them send me pictures and I'll talk a little bit about my experiences there. All right. Well, as always, uh, thanks for watching and like and subscribe, please. It helps us a lot. Um, you know, I want to get to that magic number of 1K and beyond so we could keep making more videos and do more cool stuff. All right, 73, keep on hamming. Thanks for watching. And to RJ out.